I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation.
it's not the kind of uplifting cry. It's probably more mournful, tearful, heart-wrenching, gut-turning kind of plea. Today is the hundredth anniversary of Canada's, well, coming of age. Today, a hundred years ago, today, Canada began the offensive on Jimmy Rich. Now, I have copies of two attestations of men who were there. The first one uh, was a young man who was a divinity student at Wesley College, Winnipeg. His name was Hugh Connell. He just happened to be my grandfather. The other one was for a young man from Pantanguishi. His name was Charles Ellis. And he was there as well. And he was Wendy's grandfather. What caused these young men to be in the mud at the foot of Vinny Ridge on April the 9th, 1917? hundred years ago today. What were they doing there? What was it about? The call had gone out from France. Save us. Please. On that slope, the Canadian soldiers looked up it was just a muddy pit of hell. A hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, almost the population of Oshawa, a hundred thousand French men. Their bodies broken, destroyed, dead, littered that slope. I can't even imagine. I can't even contemplate what that must have looked like to Hugh Connolly and Charles Ellis and the 15,000 other young Canadian men who stood ready to go up that slope. It's not steep. The gentle slope goes up to a ridge and two years earlier, it had been a beautiful country area, fields that grew good crops to feed the people of France and Africa, and it was a lovely spot. And there was a forested area kind of along the top of the ridge and went down to the south little quaint stone villages, <laughs> narrow little streets that people walked through and sold their wares and met their schoolmates and fell in love and raised their families and it was peaceful and lovely and a wonderful place and the weather in April, it was good. And they all probably thought that that's what life was always going to be. It'd be quaint. It would be peaceful. It would be lovely. You could raise your children in safety in those nice, narrow laneways of those French villages. When Hugh Connolly Charles Ellis signed up to go over. They weren't 
tourists. They weren't going to visit quaint little French villages like groups of Canadian youth are doing this weekend as they gather at the monument at Vinnie Ridge. A glorious monument from what I've been told. I haven't been there myself. And they're going, they're going to see the quaint villages and they're going to see the, the rolling farmlands and they're going to see that ridge and that glorious white monument. And, and then they're going to go and they're going to walk through graveyards where there's roll upon roll upon roll upon roll as far as the eye can see white crosses for 100,000 Frenchmen, 10,000 Canadians, 35,000 English, all from one battle. Why did they go? They heard the cry from the widows, the orphans, the refugees who were hiding in their basements and their bombed out churches. Save us, please. Hosanna. And they went. Charles didn't last long in the battle. Like many, he was wounded pretty quick by machine gun fire spraying down from the top of that ridge. Hugh lasted three days in that battle. It was only when the retreating German army in desperation decided it was necessary to wipe them all out. Fire out canisters of mustard gas. And then choked to death all across that slope that Hugh Connolly, who had been busy three days, three long nights, slogging up that broken slope of mud, bone, shrapnel, blood, death, pain, picking up young men, carrying them out. He was a stretcher. But the mustard gas got him, and he lost all. And it was the end of the war for both of them. They came home. They went to do the thing. They heard the cry, save us please. And they went. And they did what they could. Along with most of the other young men in Canada. Many from this area a hundred years ago. It was the first time that Canada had been its own army with its own regiments and its own command structure and was given the responsibility of winning that battle. The English had been trying for months. The French, as I said before, had been decimated on that slope and it remained the last group that maybe could turn it around and the Canadians did. And they did it through innovation. They did it through bringing in um, a different kind of a soldier to the field that nobody else had thought of, bringing mathematicians. Mathematicians who could figure out this thing they call a rolling barrage. And what is that? That's hell. That is constant pulverizing of the earth by shell fire, hellfire, and death, creeping up the hill, slaughtering everything in its path. And the Canadian men, trying not to get too close to it, followed up behind and went over the top. Well, 
my grandfather, and I'm sure everybody else who was there was traumatized by what had happened when they'd seen it. If you can imagine, a hundred years ago today. 2,000 years ago, the men, women, the children of Jerusalem, when they saw Jesus coming, they heard this hallelujah, this uh, praise be to God, and this group coming towards the gate entering into Jerusalem, a wall armed city. They cried out, save us, please. From what? People don't do that if they're comfortable in their life. They don't do that when they're running through the streets and buying things in the market. They do that when they are afraid of the wrath to come when they are afraid that what they are going to experience is <laughs> terrifying beyond description. And that's the word they use. Hosanna, save us, please. They were an occupied city. The Roman legions were there in force. Anybody who stepped out of line could be flogged where they fell could be dragged away and strung up on a cross along the roadway somewhere, could be thrown into prison, could be hauled off to serve in the Roman legions in some far off country in the north where they'd probably freeze to death. Young men were being stripped out of the country day by day by day. And Jesus came and they said, Hosanna, save us, please. And Jesus came. And he says, I am. But it's not going to be the way you think. It's not going to be through the rolling of our eye. It's not going to be by sending hellfire down upon the Romans. It isn't going to be by bringing outbreaks of plagues such as happened in Egypt. It isn't going to be darkening the sun with volcanic ash. It isn't going to be with a flood that is going to wash away all the corruption of humanity. It is going to be the only way that can actually save anybody. And it's going to be by his own sacrifice. I wonder, Hugh Connolly, as he was sitting in class in Divinity College, University of Winnipeg, <coughs> and he wondered about what was going on in Europe. And he saw the collapse of all of the systems that everybody thought would just keep on going forever, that the economies of the world would keep on going, that progress would just keep on going, that all of it would keep on going and seeing it all coming to naught. I wonder what he thought. I wonder if he sat there in that classroom and thought, well, what would Jesus do? And what did Jesus do? And Jesus went and he offered up the only thing that would make a difference, and he offered his life. And so my grandfather went off and he offered his life. No gun. A tin pot on his head. Not much more than that. And he went in and dragged, broken, wounded, dead off the field of battle, hour after hour, day after day. 
came back. And he did not complete his divinity studies. He was not ordained. He chose a different path at that point. Became a teacher. He had always remained a faithful member of the church from that day on because he knew something that that whole generation knew. The wrath of humanity only slips. It is not done. Evil is possible at any moment, even the peaceful village streets, quiet country fields. It can come. And the only way to stop that from becoming a reality again is not by visiting destruction one upon the other, not by being who's got the biggest bomb, or the longest gun, or the sharpest sword, but who has the passion, the willingness to forgive. We will be joined in the Eucharistic meal. <coughs> Eucharist meaning the embodiment of Christ. It is the meal that Jesus says is for two purposes. To remember and to forgive. Or to forgive and remember. Anger, <clears throat> vengeance, justice through violence are all points that have never worked in the entire history of humanity, that have never worked for long. <clears throat> the only ones that work is by remembering and forgiving and seeking to create community. And that's what Jesus did. He did more than that. He offered the one thing that could make a difference. He offered himself. Peace, hope, an end to suffering and violence, salvation that lasts a new way. So on this day, 100 years after Vimy Ridge, let's remember those young men, mostly, and some young women, who heard the cry from France, please save us, went over and did what they could, did things that they days before had probably considered totally unconscionable. And they did what they could. But let's also remember what we are. And who we are. And what we can do. John Wesley said that salvation is from the wrath to come. That's what it's from. But the other side of it is, what is it for? It is for eternal life. Eternal, unending, full, beautiful life. Thanks to God. The cross, we shall break it. The bread, we shall break it. The pain, we shall bear it. The joy.